guys. Uh, oh, welcome back. It's the third week. <coughs> Hello, guys. Yeah, it works. Uh, last week, we stopped on a really beautiful set of examples. Uh, the thing which I didn't realize last week is that there were two other slides in the handout which I gave on, which I associated with, the, with, with lecture two. It's not a big deal. I just moved them over to week three. If you haven't updated, I mean, if you took the week three handouts from the website before today, probably you don't have them in your handout. They're still in your week two handouts, but it's just two slides. Uh, and here they are. Mm. Basically, it's a sort of a relief because on Wednesday, I did. I tried to, did my, to do my best to convince you that differentiability, it's, it's, a, it's a concept a lot different from the one-dimensional differentiability. Yet, on many, in many examples, we can streamline testing for differentiability. Those three examples, or four examples we discussed last week, they are all sort of like a marginal examples. When you look at the elementary function, and it's well-defined in the area, differentiability will come up nicely and straightforwardly, and you don't have to comment much, much about that unless it's a question particularly about differentiability. In any other question, you can basically just say a few words and be done with it. And that's the help comes from this slide, which is moved from the, the these two last slides from the last week. Uh, they say that you can ensure differentiability by looking at the continuity of partial derivatives. So that's what that's exactly what the theorem said. It says if you have a domain in n-dimensional space, amiga, which is open and a function, if you see what it says, if you have partial derivatives, if you have partial derivatives exist and continues in this domain amiga. Yeah, in this domain amiga. And you have plenty of this. It's, it's a, basically, it's the all components of your Jacobian, right? Jacobian is a matrix, m rows, n columns. If every individual entry in that Jacobian is a continuous function in the domain amiga, it's interesting, right? Just you, you expect this to be continuous, not in the point, but in the domain. Then f is differentiable the way we define it, and that's that's a big help. It's a significant help, especially when we talk about continuous fu uh, elementary functions, because with elementary functions, continuity follows immediately as soon as they are defined, and that's and, and the, by implication, differentiability also follows. And I strongly encourage, as a matter of fact, in those four examples we did. Try to see why this theorem doesn't work there, because we had two examples where, the, where a function is not differentiable, which means that this theorem is not applicable. So it looks like in those two examples, some of the partial derivatives are not continuous or do not exist. And finding exactly this reason why this theorem doesn't work there, it's a good practice. We're not going to, we're not going to do it together, but independently, you may do it. Or you shouldn't. So on this slide, on the top of the theorem, we have an example. It's a typical example. You see a function which takes R2 to R2, purely, purely elementary function, just polynomials of some sort. With this sort of functions, we never have any troubles because partial derivatives is a Jacobian, you see. Jacobian is computed right here. Four partial derivatives, all of them elementary functions. Not only they are linear functions, as a matter of fact, they continue everywhere. And then by the theorem, the function itself is differentiable. As simple as this. You can just try to compare this with that, that much effort we invested in studying, in verifying differentiability with those four functions where this theorem didn't work. So this theorem is a significant help. It, really, it just cuts lots of, lots of effort as soon as you look at the continuous functions or continuous partial derivatives. Yeah, that's... Yeah. Well, the slide also mentions some new, not or some extra notation. I don't know, I'm not, I'm not really... Well, apparently the, the, this will be used later. So you see, G before, when we wrote Jacobian, we use a sub-index to indicate the point where Jacobian is computed. And f was the function of which the Jacobian is computed. Now, this slide suggests another notation. See? G, just sort of jf, and then the point at which the Jacobian is computed follows as if a function. 
I don't see any problem with that, quite normal notation. So it reflects the dependence of this object, which is a matrix by itself in its nature. It reflects the dependence of this object on x, y. First, original notation reflected this dependence by subscript. Now it's reflected as a bracket and x and y after that. Nothing wrong with that. I don't see why not we, why can't we just extend our supply of notations with this? Well, I have a proof for this theorem. It's not a proof, it's just an indication of a proof. Uh, yeah, and we, we can have a look into that. We, I, 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 I can try to show you why continuity of partial derivatives, if you have it in some domain, will ensure differentiability. The, this proof is put together by Jonathan Kress. We can have a look for the slides. They are relatively indicative, but just, I mean, they're not, it, is, it is not a detailed proof, but it's a good proof, and it shows you some structure. So why not? Uh, yeah. No, he called the sketch of the proof. Okay. All I have to say, I have to make some introduction into what you look. Yeah. Why is why it supposed to be growing like a... Just give me a second, I want to check something. Thank you very much. No, that's, that's apparently the file we have to look at. Okay. <coughs> you know what? I changed my mind. Uh, because uh, I think this proof will go easier and better after we discuss some something extra, which is today. So let me just put it off for, for half an hour, or maybe yeah, 20 minutes. We'll come back to this proof in 20 minutes, okay? Let's just, let's just do that. It's, it would be better if you do it like that. So let's just go back to my main set of slides. Yeah, that's what I need. Uh, it's something which I call O notation. And I'd like, to I'd like to discuss this O notation with you. So what is it? It's quite a general way of, of writing things which makes arguments and presentations shorter you won't be using this notation, I mean, you won't be needing to use, uh, to use this notation in this topic, but some of the arguments which I'm going to show, I will use these own notations, and I, in my opinion, it, it will make it more transparent and more understandable. So what, what it is, what it is, O notation? You take two functions, you see we take uh, from, from Rn to Rm, and you say that one of them is little o of the other one, that's how you read this line, f of x is little o of g of x, and this statement, it, it is always, always attached to some convergence, so it is little o with respect to the g when x approaches a. So little o notation exists only when, some, when x approaches some point. We say that if this limit, if you have such a limit. So basically, the interpretation of this whole line is right here. So sometimes when I need to write like this, or I need to give you a message that something like this happens, I will write this. It's shorter and it, it's helpful. So sometimes people officially, officially there's this term which is called infinitesimal small a measure of smallness. Sometimes this can be read this can be read like the like so. F of x in infinitesim, infinitesimally small in comparison to g of x. Or in short, f of x is a little o with respect to the g of x when x approaches a. It's just a notation or just some different language for the same well-known thing to you, this numerical limit. Pay attention to norms at the numerator and denominator. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, because we have norms here, it is not a necessity, uh, it's, not a ne it's not necessary for this to work that f and g, they end up in the same dimension. Even if they end up in different dimensions, so F, say, in dimension M1, and G in dimension M2, this limit also makes sense in that case. The only joint dimension for this, 
dimension for this notation is for the argument for Rn. So as a matter of fact, you can even write this definition in, in a wider scope. You can take f with values in Rm1 and g with values in Rm2, something I just realized. So you can change this and still this limit will make sense because you wrap the norm around the function anyway. So you convert the function into a number and this notation also makes sense. Primarily, this notation we need to alter our view on the definition of the limit, just slightly. Sorry, uh, not a limit, definition of differentiability. If I bring back the definition of differentiability, the way we discussed with you this definition on uh, last week, I mean, that's how it's going to be. Look at this. this the same definition of differentiability with the O notation language now looks like this. A function, like so, is differentiable at the point, x equal a, if and only if there is a matrix, L matrix, this matrix, such that the expression of this type is little o with respect to x take a. And I don't know if you remember how we define, if you remember the definition of differentiability from last week, but I'll try to just tell it to you. I can't, I don't want to bring it on the slide right now. There, we did four examples last week. Every time we were looking at the limit, remember the limit had this expression in the numerator under the norm and x take a in the denominator under the norm. That's the kind of limit we looked at four times, at least four times last week. And now, let me just go back to the slide before. Instead of the quotient of two norms, I write this. Let alone. If you read this in this plain English description, you should say that the function is differentiable when you have a matrix, m times n, such that when you build, when you build the expression like that, this expression will be infinitesimally small in comparison to the increment of the argument. So you increment the argument, but this expression, it will, it will change as well. Like when you, when you alter your x, when you alter your, your x, your, this expression on the left-hand side, it will alter as well, but it will alter in comparably smaller to the x to a alteration. This is little o, that's exactly what it's about. The alteration of this left-hand side is negligibly small or infinitesimally small in comparison to the alteration or increment of x like this. And the precise meaning when we put in this negligibly small or infinitesimally small here. That's the precise limit, a precise meaning we put into this plain English description. And we tested this many times already with you last week. All right, so after we have this, we can go back to the proof of the differentiability result. Because in that differentiability result, my job will be to show that if I take something like this with L, obviously for the L, we have a Jacobian matrix choice. If I take something like this, this will be infinitesim infinitesimally small in comparison to the difference x take a. That's the whole idea which is driven for, that, for, for, the, for those five slides in the proof I'm about to show you. We're going to take this left-hand side with the choice of L, Jacobian, in place of L. And we're going to make sure that this expression is so small. The smallness of this expression is a lot less, incomparably less than smallness of x and a. Let me just go back there. Well, I just... Mm. Well, this last line we just showed up, uh, just the other way to write the same, the other way to write the same line. It's very often what happens is just you take this whole thing and you move it on the right hand side, which is like an algebraic transformation. Now you say that the, the value of the function near point A, it's given, that the, by, given by this principal part and then infinitesimally, infinitesimally small change in comparison to the increment of x. Uh, okay, let's just try to look at that proof. Mm. 
<clears throat> so here's what happens. I alter my point, that's my A point, bold face A, and I gave the point an increment. That's my X bold face point. So I changed my argument, and I need to convince you that the change of a function from this point to, th to this point will be infinitesimally small in comparison to the, this distance, this red vector. So the proof goes like that. You just, you just take this difference, and you split it, you, you, take, you take this change, and you split it in two sub-changes. One of them horizontal one, and one of them vertical one. And for each of that, you present your own control, your own estimate. For each of that, the proof tries to convince you that this one will be infinitesim infinitesimally small in comparison to the, I mean, the function, the change of the function from this black point to this corner will be infinitesimally small in comparison to the distance, the blue distance. And then the upper one, the same story. Two slides do the same thing, look at this. So, and then the, this actual control, the actual estimate is done by some results from the first year. Well, in particular, you can see it here, the mean value theorem. So look what it says. The mean value theorem, if you remember, it says this, that you can always uh, replace the difference of the function in the endpoints. And that's what's happening here. You see, we take the difference of the function in the point x0 plus h1. h1 is the increment, the horizontal increment, or horizontal part of the increment. And why not? So this point on the left-hand side, that's the corner point. This. And x0, y0 is the original black point. So the change of the function between these two points can be replaced by the derivative in some middle point times the increment of the argument. That's exactly the statement of the mean value theorem. Now, because the derivative is continuous, because the derivative is continuous, I mean, in the, we don't like this, we don't like this factor in front of the increment because it's factor which lives in some intermediate point. We'd like to have a factor which lives exactly in the original black point because that's what we have in the Jacobian. And so here the continuity comes and helps because I want to replace this selected factor with the factor with this number in the point x0, y0. In, in general, they're not identical, but because of continuity, we can make them small. Or by, well, actually, if you just uh, open this absolute value, you can expect something like this. So the difference between the derivative in the corner point and the derivative in the original black point, because of the continuity, it can be controlled by some number epsilon like so. So if you just replace, replace this factor with the right-hand side here, that's what you're going to end up with. And that is, if you look carefully, you can, I mean, the experienced analyst here can see this infinitesimally small increment. Look at this. We got F. Oh, what's the hell? We got just, uh, let me just. Quickly go back, back to the infinitesimally small definition. Let me, just, let me just go back here. Look at this, what it says. It says f of x take f of a, then take linear factor. So difference between the arguments times some number or matrix, numerical matrix, and then something smaller than the difference between the arguments. Just take a picture of that. And now let's just, I mean, take a picture with your eyes of that. And let's just go back here. Uh, and here. here. That's exactly this. Difference of the function in the x point and the original point, and then the linear factor. And then something, look at this, smaller than the increment, because we got the increment here, h1, and then another small factor, epsilon. That's my infinitesimally small factor comes in. It's not a formal proof, but it's sort of explanation of the O notation and why this works, well, to some extent. Right here, you can see it already with some effort. That's my f of x. That's my f of a. I mean, when I say f of x, both face, f of a, both face, l. That's the l that plays the role of l. That's the difference of x and a. And that's the difference of x and a. And this epsilon, that's my little o, which makes it smaller than the increment. 
That's the whole idea of this thing. So that's how you estimate the increment across the blue section. For the, for the B section, for the right section, you do the same thing. Yeah, that's, that's, that's it just changed instantly. I mean, the slide changed instantly. For the blue section, again, the same story. That's the X0, H1, H, uh, H2 point. That's the black point at the top. This is a corner point. You use MVT again. And if you look down at this line, at the very back, at the very end of the slide, you can again see this little O writing. Function in the endpoint. Function in the function in the original point. Some numerical factor times the increment of the argument, which is this time H2, and then minimizing something which pushes even lower, this epsilon 2 dash, times the increment of the argument. Okay. Well, if you combine these two increments together, it was done here in, this, in, this, in these lines, you will end up with the complete O notation right here. Look at this. It's just facing, it's just looking at us right here. Function in the original point, function in the, sorry, the other way around. Function in the final point, this upper blo uh, black dot, a uh, black point. Uh, function in the original point, lower black point. And then look at the final right hand side. Matrix numerical factor, I mean matrix constant factor, increment of your x, x, and then increment of the x times something which makes it even smaller. This epsilon now comes here as a factor. Yeah, that's, that's all there is to it. I mean, that's the whole principal idea about this proof and about the O notations. Uh, it's, a, it's a difficult, I mean, it's, it's not a difficult proof for the experienced analyst. For the people of, on your level of mathematical development, it's a difficult proof to absorb. If you won't succeed 100%, don't get upset. Something like this, you're not, you, know, you won't be uh, asked to write on your own in a test or exam or any other place. It's just for your, well, just to just show you something a little bit higher than is minimum requirement for this course. Yeah, and that's the end of it. Right, so back to my own notation. Back to my own notation and differentiability, which is defined by our own notation. Uh, the way when we define differentiability by our own notation, there is one piece which you need to know for formal success in this topic, which is called the affine, affine approximation of the function. So when your function is differentiable, you can always expect something like this. So you can find some, so the function will be just the value of the function, the point, plus some linear map, by the way, isn't it? It's something which you call linear map in the first year. When you multiply a matrix by a vector of uh, uh, x1, x2, xn, it's something which you call linear map in the first year, didn't you? So. Differentiability ensures that the function at any point around A, basically equal to value at A, plus some linear map, and plus some infinitesimally small, infinitesimally small piece. Well, these two first components in this representation, they have a special name, and the name which you have to know, we call, we call the affine approximation of the map F near the point A. So the first two, That, that is what is called the affine approximation. In case, in case when m is 1, in case when m is 1, this will be just a regular linear function because in that case, L will be matrix with one row and n columns. So this will be a regular dot product in that case. I mean, this term will be a regular dot product in that case. Are you going to select? It doesn't want to select. Uh, and that will be just a linear function. In that case, so when case is m equal 1, Jacobian takes, like I said, one row and columns. This L matrix becomes of this structure. And so this expression becomes a numerical. You see, I changed the face of t. It's no longer bold. It's a regular t. So it's a number this time. And that is what we call the tangent plane, something we discovered with you on Friday. 
when function is differentiable, visually or yes, geometrically, it means that for to, we can find a tangent plane to that function at the point where it is differentiable. And this tangent plane, analytically, these are these two first components in the O notation or in the O version of the differ definition of differentiability. So next time somebody asks you to find a tangent plane to a graph of the three-dimensional functions, all you have to do, you have to evaluate this right-hand side. And that just requires finding this Jacobian matrix, specially structured Jacobian matrix, one row and columns. For such matrix, we have a special name, we call it the gradient, because it's just a vector, or matrix of one row and then columns. And that's two different notations for the gradient. It's quite obvious notation. This one... This letter is called, when you have this upright triangle, it's called NABLA, N-A-B-L-A. N for Nicholas, A for Ashley, B for Boris, L for Lawrence, A for Ashley. Well, John Tocres put together this little example where you need to find the tangent plane to a function. It's a straightforward computational question. doesn't require much of the thinking. All you have to do, all you have to do, you have to convince everyone that the function has tangent plane or, a.k.a., function is differentiable at the point where you're trying to find the tangent plane. And for that, you cannot just use the theorem we started with today because elementary function, all of its partial derivatives, all of it is a partial derivatives, is a Jacobian, all of them are also elementary functions. They continue everywhere. So that's why the function is differentiable. And that's why this function has tangent plane everywhere. In the, at every point, it has a tangent plane. If you'd like to find the tangent plane in this particular point, you just compute the value of the function at this point, gradient or Jacobian at this point. Pay attention to this new notation. You see the point is list is written after, not as a subscript, as it was before, but after. And that's the tangent plane. Function at the point, linear factor, and increment of the argument. The old piece, the third piece in the definition of is dropped. You drop it, you end up with a tangent plane. Well, that's a graph probably from Maple or MATLAB. With some effort, I can reconstruct something like this in GNU plot, but it's probably useless right now. Any questions? No? Mm, it's quite expectable. It's a very straightforward computational question. As far as I... Let me just have a look. Okay. Well, for today, I planned another proof uh, of, the next of, the, uh, okay, of the result on the next slide, and then that most likely will be the end of the proofs for this week. Like I promised you, oh, most likely, most likely, there might be an exception. Uh, like I promised, like, like I told you earlier, because the difficulty of the material grows significantly as we progress through the course, like, for instance, the proof we, I tried to explain to you, it's the sketch of the proof I tried to explain to you just, just now, uh, there will be less and less proofs because it, it just they go already beyond your level of, um, at, well, at your, at your, beyond your current level. We, 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 we're going to see more and more examples, but still, there will be some proofs. One of them I'll, I'm going to show you today. That's the one which justifies the chain rule. Uh, chain rule, unlike, say, tangent plane, which is did, chain rule, it's difficult both well, for your concern, it's actually difficult computationally. It's significant. I mean, it's computationally, chain rule may cause lots of lots of lots of difficulties, even for very experienced people. Sometimes I make mistakes with the chain rule in multiple variables. Uh, so you will have lots of practice. Uh, one other thing to remember is that you, with the chain rule, it's very good to have double checks and like a second ways of doing things because that will help you to verify that you everything you did through is correctly. Is this correct? Sorry. Uh, and I'll show you a few ways how you can see this, uh, how you can double check your own computations because, yeah, double check is always good. Uh, but for now, that's the result. 
which you call the chain rule. I state it as a theorem. It's a chain rule for the function of multiple uh, variables, several variables. Look what it says. If I have two functions, f and g, which live in their own domains, for f I call it d, for g I call it d dash, look at the dimensions of the domain and codomains. Here you got n, m, here you got m, it's a link between f and g. That's right. And here you got some other integer p. So if it happens so that the domain d is taken to the domain d dash by f, and if it happens so that f is differentiable at point A and g is differentiable at the image of that point on the f map, B, then if you build a new function, a composition of f and g, of, sorry, that's a typo, it's supposed to be f. Well, that's, that's, that's explained here. If you build a new function, which is a composition, then this new function will also be differentiable at the point A. Not only that, you have a formula how to find the derivative of this new function. You have to multiply, and this product, it's the matrix product. It's when you multiply this matrix by this matrix. They are of compatible dimensions. Remember, when you multiply matrices, they must be of compatible dimensions. So the left factor must, be, must have the same number of columns as the right factor has rows. And that is exactly the case, because the number of columns here in G is M, number of arguments, and the number of rows here is M again. It's a dimension of codomain. So these two matrices, they are compatible, and if you multiply them, yeah, that will be the derivative of the H of the, of the composition function. Okay. Uh, let's just look at the proof of this. That's where the O notation even work in its best. Yeah, look at this. That's the statement of my chain rule theorem, just repeated on this slide. It's the same statement. It's very good proof. Very, it's a short, straightforward proof, as a matter of fact. As, as soon as you have this O notation, the proof becomes a piece of cake. I love it. Uh, listen to this. So first, I take this assumption that F is differentiable which I marked with the asterisk. And I'm just going to expand it with my own notation. Here it is. Function being differentiable means that there is a matrix L, and we even have an exact choice for this matrix. That's the, that's the Jacobian. Oh, we can't take the derivative. It doesn't matter such that the f of x is f of a plus the linear piece, so this is a fine approximation, my tangent plane, and then, then this little o piece. That's a differentiability in one line. Of course, it's, a, it's, still, it's still some sort of limit of quotients of two norms, but it, this all hidden here in this notation. We just shoveled it there because just took it all out of the way. Now. That's, that's the line which is implied by the first asterisk. Double asterisk, so differentiability of my G function. The same expansion via O notation is this. Where this G, it's another matrix, another derivative. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to, I'm going to take my H function, which is combination, which is a composition of G and F. And I'm going to replace this f of y with f of x. Look at this. So h of x, which is by definition g of f of x, as a composition. Now, instead of this f of x, I'm plugging this long expression. So this one goes like this. So 
Let me just open this. Yeah. So I replace my y in here with the f of x with its right hand side. And with the help of this expansion, that becomes like this the g of b, then my g factor, y is the f of x right in here. And here y is replaced with f of x like this. Actually, I said it wrong. I said I replaced the f of x with the right hand side. No, I don't. I didn't do that. My apologies. Uh, I just I just took this second line and I replaced y with f of x in here, in here, and in here. That's all I did. As simple as this. Now time has come to use the first line. If I use because b originally b is like so. So f of x take b. It's what happens if you take this piece on the left hand side, and then I can replace this difference by. The remaining piece on the right-hand side, both in this factor and in this little O notation, is my replacement. So this B is replaced with the F of A, as it is, right from here. This difference, oh, actually, I haven't done it. It's the next step. I just replaced B with, with the F of A. I'm too detailed in my expositions, as a matter of fact. So this B is replaced with F of A, this B replaced with F of A, and this B re replaced with the F of A. And now I'm going to use this line, finally. For this difference and for this difference, I'm going to keep these two terms. Hopefully. That's the, that's the one. Yes, it is the one. I'll just look into this. G of F of A, just H of A. When I replace this difference with these two terms, I did the expansion, so the first term in this place gives you these two pieces, g times l times x take a, and now you can already see the feeling why we have the product of matrices, g times l. The second piece of that expansion is right here, and this one, this piece, after I replaced f of x take f of a with these two terms, it's right in here. So I will summarize what just happened. Uh, we use the we use the O notation for two differentiability given to us, and then I just did some computations where, yeah, I just did, did some computations with the help of these two two lines. Now the actual argument comes here. Look at this. Let me just call this this little O of x take a with a shorter name, with a w of x. It's some sort of function, isn't it? Why not just give it a shorter name? If I use today's definition to interpret what the little o means, that's the interpretation. It means that this function is infinitesimally small in comparison to this function. That is the expansion. But listen to this. This enumerate function, w e x, if I multiply this enumerator function by another G matrix, which is a matrix of numbers, it's independent of X, then I can equally say that the limit where W is, is multiplied by extra G factor is also zero. Because if you multiply a limit by a number, I mean, if you multiply a zero limit by a number, the limit also will be number. Which means if I now interpret this limit thing again with the O notation, it means that this new function, g times wx, it's another little o with co in comparison to x take a. It may be a different function. It is a different function in principle. But it's still little o. Different little o, but still little o. So this whole piece can be just abbreviated into another little o. Well, I can use the same logic, which I didn't explain in this slide, for this piece. And this longer piece can also be just replaced with another little o. And these two little o's together can be combined into the... So similarly, the second term with the, with the little o can be, after a bit of an argument, converted into just one little o 
even though different, but still one little o. And when you add them together, these two little o's, by this definition, it again will be another, just one single little o. So eventually, look what happens. We started with the h of x. In this line, h of a, h of a we kept. This piece we kept. The other two we combined into a single little o. And in this line, you can recognize differing definition of differentiability. Look at this function h near point a. It's the value of the function in the point a plus linear piece, a fine approximation, and a little o piece. It means that this function is differentiable and this product delivers the derivative. This product, as predicted, delivers the derivative. That's how the chain rule can be proved on one and a third of a slide with the help of the all notation. It's another not easy proof, I mean, because you just, I mean, it's not easy because you need to absorb first the O notation. But like I said, it just, for your information, mostly, there won't be any examples in this topic which require from you O notation or, yeah, which require from you O notation of this, or this high level of proof anyway. Any questions? Uh, do you have any questions? Yes. Um, I'm still not If you try to prove this with a limit definition of differentiability, it's in principle this is doable, yeah. but I'd like to see into that. I mean, you, if you <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you this: when you start doing that, when you start putting together the limit definition, uh, uh, this proof with the limit definition, yeah. you will appreciate the beauty of the all notations. After five minutes of doing that, you will realize how horrible it turns out, and how good it is to use the all notations. That's why they were invented in the first place, yeah. because they make exposition easy. Okay, that's why that's why we invent names and ter terms and definitions because they make the uh, transferring of the knowledge easier. You can try, and if you succeed, show me. I, I want to have a look. I saw a few. You can try, but I, I'm, I bet that by the like a 15 minutes for you you for, for this for this challenge, you will appreciate the beauty of the annotations. Any other questions? Right. Uh, if you don't have any other questions, we have quite a few examples with the chain rule practice. That will take lots of time this week, which is good, because it's lots of, like I said, most likely it's the last proof this week. We'll just try a few examples. There are uh, a few examples which I put, there are a few examples which I put by Jonathan Cress. There are a few examples which I put myself, which I think also good to know. But I'll start with his examples. They are simple and very detailed. So keep in mind that the chain rule the main principle of the chain rule is this, I mean, computationally, computationally, the chain rule is this line. In principle, it looks like, like the one-dimensional chain rule. In one-dimensional chain rule, it, there was also a product of two derivatives, outer function derivative times the inner function derivative. The same story here. Inner function derivative, outer function derivative, right? G is outer function, F is inner function. So it's again the same product, even though this time it's a matrix product. And that's why the order is important and the compatibility of dimensions is important. Okay. This is first example. So the inner function is first, well, yeah, the, this, the, the slides here are structured like this. First, uh, just a computation, and then the, the next slide just shows you the structure of the computation which links this to the theorem which is so. Uh, so g, here it is, it's a function of two variables, numerical function, that's the value it delivers, like this, like that. X and Y in itself, they are the function of the functions of the other two variables, R and theta. So basically you're looking at G function, which takes R2 into R, and if F function, which takes R2 into R2, right? R and theta pair into X and Y pair. 
So here's the computation of the derivative. So you can do it directly. As a matter of fact, that's, that's, that's a very correct comment. You don't need any, in principle, you don't need any multi-dimensional chain rule to do this question. You can directly substitute your functions, x and y, into your g function. That's a direct substitution, right? r cos theta for x, r squared sine squared theta for y. That's the resulting function you end up with. And you can just take the partial derivative of that. No chain rule needed at all. So when you take a partial, ah, it's taken already here, the partial derivative of this with respect to the r. You can also do the same question with the help of a chain rule. That's what the chain rule says. If you compute the derivative of g with respect to the r via chain rule, you just differentiate g with respect to the x, then x with respect to the r, plus g with respect to the y, y with respect to the r, r sorry. If you ask me where this formula came from, I'll tell you just wait for the next slide and you will see. But that's, that's the version of the chain rule, version of the theorem we just discovered in this setting, in the setting when g takes r2 to r1 and f take, uh, takes r2 to r2. And if you use this, if you use individually every component here, g by x is y squared, x by r is cos theta, g by y is double yx, double xy, and y by r is sine theta. It's the same, ex it's the same value, which is here, which is obtained directly. Well, that's a legitimate question where this formula came from. Just, again, just take a picture of this formula, look at of this formula. It says, again, g by x and then, and then x by r plus g by y and y by r. If you take a picture of this formula, now you, I'll show you why it, where it came from. So that's what I told you before. g is a function which takes r, r, r2 to r. f is a function which takes r2 to r2. And here it is. The Jacobian of f is this matrix, two by two matrix. The Jacobian of g is this matrix, two by one, uh, one by two matrix. So when you multiply these two, they are of compatible dimensions, right? Number of rows here, the same as the number of columns here. When you multiply them, when you multiply them, this is a formula you just saw on the slide before. This is a formula you just saw on the slide before. So you see, the theorem in its statement has the same product of two derivatives, the derivative of the outer function, here it is, dg, and derivative of the inner function, df. But the matrix product in between, which is in the theorem, is sort of hidden by the statement, by the symbols. The matrix product does this beautiful job, which is pro produces this long and tricky formula for each of the individual derivatives. This is just a product. The first component of this matrix product computed according to the rules you learned in the first year. And this is the component, second component of this matrix. So every time you do a chain rule, you can, cha you can trace this up to this single matrix multiplication. After a while, of course, you will realize you don't need to do it for the computational purposes. But in principle, every time this can be done, you can trace this back to the single matrix multiplication, like it is done on this slide. Any questions? No? All right. It, well, it wasn't an easy lecture. Thank you very much for your patience. Uh, we will see more examples the day after tomorrow. Thanks. Thank you.